Africa is the final track on the 1982 album Toto 4 by the American rock band Toto. It was written by the band's keyboard player David Page and despite initial reluctance from the rest of the band became one of their most popular songs. The song top charts in the UK, Canada, Ireland, the Netherlands, New Zealand and Switzerland as well as reaching number one on the US Billboard charts. To this day it is the band's only number one hit. In a 2015 interview with The Guardian, Page explained that the song is about a man's love of the continent Africa rather than just a personal romance. As a kid, I had always been fascinated by Africa, Page told the interviewer. I loved movies about Dr. Livingstone and missionaries. I wrote about a person flying in to meet a lonely missionary. It's a romanticized love story about Africa based on how I'd always imagined it. The descriptions of its beautiful landscape came from what I'd read in National Geographic. Toto employs heavy use of synthesizers and percussion instruments alongside more traditional rock instruments to create the African style groove and timbre of the song. Jeff Picaro, Toto's drummer, acknowledges the influence of session musicians Milt Holland and Emil Richards, as well as the African pavilion drummers at the 1964 New York World's Fair. For this analysis, I wanted to focus on what sets Africa apart from your typical pop song. Generally in pop music, your song will follow a standard verse-chorus structure, maybe with a bridge thrown in for good measure, nice neat four-bar phrases with a consistent time signature, and harmony is kept fairly simple with chords and melody rarely deviating from the key established at the top of the song. Obviously there are exceptions to this, but there's a reason these formulas are so popular. They work. On the surface, Africa seems like it fits into this mold. It's often referred to as one of those four chord songs, which is true for a small part of the chorus, but you very quickly start running into some problems, and the reason for these problems will be the focus of this video. The name of the game for Africa is Subversion of Expectation, and I want to look at the various ways Toto subverts your expectations throughout Africa. Let's start by breaking the song down into parts. It starts with a drum and percussion groove that will underpin the entire song. Then comes the iconic hook. The hook is essentially a call and response. The initial call part is played on the Yamaha CS80 using a brass patch, and the response is played on the Yamaha GS1 with a kalimba patch. Next comes the verse. The verse changes slightly on the fourth repeat to lead into the chorus, and I'll refer to this part as the pre-chorus. Next is everybody's favorite part, the chorus. Then there's another hook and a slightly shorter verse before moving into the pre-chorus. This verse also contains some of the greatest lyrics ever written. Another chorus, the same as the last, another hook, back to the verse, which this time is used as a basis for the keyboard solo, the pre-chorus, a final much longer chorus, and the final hook, which is repeated ad nauseum while the parts slowly drop out from the mix and the song fades out. There are three techniques Toto uses to subvert our expectations in Africa. The first is the use of odd rhythmic phrases, the second is utilizing non-standard harmony, and the third is the modulation between two unrelated key centers. Let's take a look at these one by one. First, odd rhythmic phrases. So what do I mean when I say odd rhythmic phrases? At this point I'm going to introduce and define three musical terms, cadence, motif, and yes, phrase. All of these words have very broad meanings and can mean different things depending on context and specifics, but since I don't want to go into a whole 30 minute long theory lesson about each term, I'm going to loosely define them here and then use them in an example so you can get an idea of how they're used in relation to Africa. I have talked about motif and cadence in a lot more depth in previous videos, so if you want a more thorough explanation, go and check out those in this card thing here. Much like how language can be broken down into paragraphs, sentences, clauses, etc, etc, so too can music. These are called phrases. These phrases can be broken down further into smaller ideas or motifs, which can be separated, much like how punctuation is used in language, with cadences. A cadence can be either strong or weak. Strong cadences sound final and resolved, while weak cadences do not. Let's take a look at a piece of music we'll all be familiar with. Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. As we sing through the song, there are many places where the music naturally feels complete. These also tend to feel like good places to take a breath. And just like in language, these are good indicators of where a sentence or a phrase is complete. In language, this is where we put a full stop. In music, this is called a strong cadence. Notice how it sounds final and resolved. 
much like the sentence, we were out of milk so I went to the store, this first phrase contains two clauses or motifs and requires a comma to separate them. This comma comes in the form of a weak cadence and you hear it as you sing through this line. Notice how unresolved it sounds. So this first line of Twinkle Twinkle starts with a motif that ends in a weak cadence that leads into the second motif that ends in a strong cadence. These two motifs together make up the phrase and much like in the sentence, we were out of milk so I went to the store, neither clause or motif makes much sense without the other. I mentioned briefly at the start that pop music tends to fall into nice even four bar phrases and as you can see, so does Twinkle Twinkle here. Let's take a look at some examples from the verses of Billboard Hot 100 tracks from the same year that Africa was number one, 1983. Man Eater by Hall & Oates, the verses are made up of four bar phrases repeated four times. Down Under by Men at Work is four bar phrases repeated two times. Come On Eileen by the Dixie Midnight Runners are four bar phrases repeated four times, with the last time being four bars plus a six four bar. Let's Dance by David Bowie, the verses are four bar phrases repeated four times. Every Breath You Take by The Police, the verses are four bar phrases repeated four times. And Sweet Dreams by The Eurythmics, the verse slash chorusy thing is, you guessed it, four bar phrases repeated four times. So with the exception of one little two four bar popped in between the verse and chorus of Come On Eileen, all these other number one songs from 1983 had verses built on four bar phrases which were repeated an even number of times, either two or four. This is what we expect in music. The four bar phrase is heavily ingrained into our consciousness by the influence of hundreds of years of popular music. So what does Africa do? The verses look like this. It's a five bar phrase with a two four bar right here. This five bar phrase is repeated three times before moving on to the pre-chorus. During the second verse, it's only repeated two times, and on the final verse slash keyboard solo, it's only played once. Toto has defied our expectations by breaking away from the mold of the traditional four bar phrase in favor of a five bar phrase. But not only that, they repeat that phrase an odd number of times, then an even number of times, and then odd again. It's brilliant. Another example of odd phrasing in Africa happens right at the start of the song in the hook. The hook itself is two bars long and the beat is established by the drums as a solid 4-4 but the synth and the bass do something a little different. The phrase they play is only three beats long. This creates a heavy accent that lands on the fourth beat of the bar making it feel more like the beginning of a new bar which in fact it's not. The first few times I listened to this it really threw me off because you expect to count from here as the start of the new bar but if you do that you end up coming up short at the end of the bar and everything falls apart. But that's not all. Toto also takes this odd three beat phrase from the hook and puts it at the end of every five bar phrase in the verses. They're really not getting held back by convention. I've added some resources about phrasing in the boxy thing down there if you want to do some more reading on the subject. Next let's look at Toto's use of non-standard harmony. Just like with rhythm and the use of even phrases etc, harmony in pop music tends to stick to some standard sets of rules. Instead of just telling you what these are, I'm going to take a look at some of the same songs from the Billboard Top 100 and see if we can glimpse some similarities in their use of harmony and then we can compare that to what Africa gets up to. I'm also going to look at some of the number ones from this year, 2000. 2020, the year of our Lord, just for funds. Cool? Dope. Before we get started, I need to define a few more musical terms chord, triad, and harmony. This may sound like basic stuff, but it's best to clarify. A chord is a group of three or more notes played simultaneously. A triad is a specific sort of chord that only contains three notes. And when I refer to the harmony of a song, it's basically shorthand for chords or chord progression. When we refer to a chord with a single letter in its name, like C or F, it is implied that these are major triads. If the chord is followed by a lowercase m, then it's a minor triad, like C minor or F minor. Again, I'm not going to get into the super nitty gritty of how triads are built because we'll be here all damn day, but if you can just take it for granted that a major triad is built by stacking a major third interval followed by a minor third, and a minor triad is the opposite of that with a minor third interval followed by a major third, we should be able to get through this with little to no stress. Okay, last thing, if we take a major scale, and we go through and build triads from every note of the scale, making sure to only use notes that are in that scale, we end up with seven chords. 
all of which are part of that major scale. We can then label them with Roman numerals like this, uppercase Roman numerals for major triads and lowercase for minor. You have no doubt heard people, even myself, refer to things like five chords and one chords and flat two, sharp five, flat nine chords. Well, this is what we are referring to, the chords relationship to the tonic of the key. This is a very handy thing to start doing, as you'll soon find out, many pop songs follow a similar formula when it comes to the harmony they use, and understanding this can be very helpful when you are analyzing harmony or just trying to memorize songs. With that said, let's have a look at these pop songs. First I'll transpose them all into C major, then I'll label the chords with their appropriate Roman numerals so we can more easily notice patterns in these chord progressions. Okay, so there are a few bits we can just ignore because they're in minor keys and that's not really what we're talking about right now. The first thing I notice is that every song with only a few exceptions, hey, get out of here, stick strictly to the key that is established at the beginning of a section. By that I mean if the key of the verse is established as D, all the chords in the verse will be in the key of D. We'll talk about changing key from section to section a little later. Next I notice a couple of similarities between chord progressions. Let's dance and every breath you take are one, six, four, five. Come on Eileen and land down under use a slight variation of this progression, one, five, six, four, and stuck with you varies it slightly more by adding in the three chord. Circles is also very similar to Let's Dance with 1, 4, and 5. Fact is, a majority of pop songs are going to be sticking to various combinations of these six chords. Dean Olive over at soundfly.com analyzed every song that cracked the Billboard Top 5 in 2018 and came up with this graph. As you can see, the most used chords in a major key are 1, 4, 5, and 6, with 2 and 3 being used a lot less often. And we can see these trends in the songs that we've looked at here. Every song uses 1, Every song uses 5, the majority use 4, slightly less of a majority use 6, and a minority use 2 and 3. In fact, there are whole lists you can find on the internet listing common combinations of these 6 chords and which songs use them, which, like I said, makes it super easy to memorize dozens of these songs. If you know that Don't Stop Believing, You're Beautiful, Paparazzi, When I Come Around, Save Tonight, Apologize, It's My Life, Barbie Girl, Time to Say Goodbye, Someone Like You, and Torn are all one five, six, four, then it's going to be really easy to play those songs when you need to, right? Start one. Okay, so what does Africa do? First, I want to look at what we expect it should do based on what we've learned about pop harmony. The verse for Africa is in B, but let's stick to C for now. Okay, so we know that the verse should contain any one of these six chords if we're sticking to pop conventions. C, D minor, E minor, F, G, and A minor. But what order should they be in? Well, a good indicator of this will be the melody of the song. It's highly likely that the songwriter had a melody in mind and chose chords to fit with that melody. David Page talks about writing the lyrics about a fictionalized version of Africa in his head. He likely had a melody that went along with those lyrics and then he fit the chords to that. I could just be making shit up, but since we have a melody and we're trying to figure out what the chords should be based on pop conventions, that's what we're gonna do. So, here's the melody. Now I'm going to fit some chords to this melody based on which chords work with each melody note. Okay, so some of these are just dumb and lame, but others work pretty well. I like this one the best. It's got a cool descending bass line, which we'll talk about Toto's bass line in a sec, and the chords fit really well, even this E creating a hip sounding D minor 9 in the 2-4 bar. <laughs> Overall, this is definitely what we would expect had Toto stuck to the rules outlined by pop music, but they didn't. Let's look at what Toto actually does. The chord progression for the verse goes like this. One, three, six. Six over five. Flat seven over four. Two over five. Six and then flat seven. So the first oddity I notice is they never go to the five or the four chord, but they do play the three, the six, and even an inversion of the two. This is straight up backwards from what the trends told us about pop music, though that's not the biggest surprise. In the place where we most expect to hear the four here, Toto actually plays a flat seven. In C, that's B flat, or in B, that's A. Now, I may be making more of this than I should. After all, Toto aren't the only band that use 
this type of chord change. In fact, here it is in Maneater. Here it is in When I Was Your Man by Bruno Mars. Here it is in one of my favorite songs of all time, Lover You Should Have Come Over by Jeff Buckley. In fact, here it is in Rosanna, one of Toto's other hit songs. So if it's actually a common thing to do, then why the hell am I talking about it? Because the purpose of using this chord in a chord progression is to subvert your expectations. We expect that Toto would go to the four chord here because we've been taught by countless pop songs that that is what should happen. The key is established, the melody implies it, and the bass line is heading that way too, but then BAM! flat 7 chord. The next thing we expect is for the phrase to end on the 5 chord, but instead Toto goes back to the first part of the hook, which also happens to be the flat 7 chord. That's twice in the space of a few bars that Toto has chosen to go to the flat 7 chord rather than the chord we expect. While I do think that part of that decision would have been to make the song more interesting with these little curveballs, another part might have something to do with what we're going to look at in this last part of the analysis. Modulation between two unrelated key sets. So, like we've established, the verse of Africa is in the key of B major, but the hook and the chorus are both in the key of A major, which is super odd. If you were to pick two keys for your song to modulate between, keys a tone apart like this would be close to your last choice, right up there with a semitone apart and a tritone apart. That being said, Come On Eileen does it, so what do I know? <laughs> Like I said, there are going to be exceptions to all the things I'm talking about here. Even Toto, while breaking harmonic conventions in the verse of Africa, sticks to a 6-4-1-5 progression in the chorus. And that's probably why the chorus is so damn catchy. It's gonna take a lot to drive me away from you. So Toto was modulating between A major in the hook and chorus and B major in the verses, but how do they do that? Well, I hinted at this a little bit towards the end of the last part. What I believe they have done is warmed our ear up to the idea that A major and B major can work together. And they do this by sneaking little tastes of A major into the mix with B major. They start the song off in an A major tonality. They sneak that little A major chord in as a substitute for E major, the four of B. And then they preface every chorus with the hook that, as we know, is in A major. All this setting us up to just accept that the chorus modulates into A major. I was thinking about this and wondered if Africa would work if it just stuck to the one key, if it used standard chord changes in the verse and stayed in B major for the chorus. And oddly enough, it does. Have a listen. <laughs> though. It's too bland. There's no spice. One of the things I find enjoyable about art is when it catches me off guard, when I expect something to go one way, but it doesn't, when my expectations are subverted. It's the chili and chocolate, the collaboration of Taylor Swift and Kendrick Lamar, the main character dying at the end of the first book and leaving his friends to deal with the consequences of his society toppling actions. Damn you, Kelsia! Vin needs you or Jim Carrey in serious theatrical roles. And obviously not all music needs to be like this because then that would just be the norm and that would be boring. But just like how sometimes a hamburger can be given a little bit of an extra kick by adding some hot sauce, your song might be improved by doing a toto and subverting our expectations. Howdy friends, I hope you enjoyed this. I decided to try a slightly different format from how I usually analyze songs, but I think this worked pretty well. If you have a song that you'd like to see analyzed like this, then please let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to take a look. If you enjoyed this video, then please go ahead and do the liking and subscribing, as well as sharing it with your friends. If you want to support my work, then you can become one of my patrons over at patreon.com. I just added some new patron rewards, such as access to transcriptions of the music I analyze. Or you can just buy me a coffee over at ko-fi.com. I hope you're all safe and healthy. Uh, remember to wash your hands, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.